Well, hi, everybody. It's uh, really a, a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Soren uh, for inviting me, and even more to thank him, I'm sure this has been mentioned, for somehow getting snapped to perform yesterday. I don't know, I didn't realize it was a lifetime dream of mine <laughs> to be front row for a live performance of uh, Rhythm as a Dancer, but I certainly fulfilled that dream without knowing I had it. And I think so did our host, uh, our, our uh, master Monies, who actually put in some pretty good moves, I gotta say. So it is a great uh, pleasure to, to be here to address you. And I'm gonna really talk about two things uh, today. I wanna talk a little bit about the past and about the future. So I want to talk about your industry and the efforts related to net neutrality that have been so important for protecting this industry and for making the internet competitive, innovative, profitable, a high growth engine of, of development. And then talk about the future and some of the threats that I see are on the horizon both for your industry in particular and for the entire internet economy. So that's basically going to be the structure of my talk. Now I'm gonna begin and say it's a particular pleasure to talk to people uh, in the hosting industry and uh, equipment uh, uh, related to it. Uh, I used to, myself, I had, uh, part of my career was in Silicon Valley. We, uh, I was in the, made a uh, router, I didn't personally make it. Um, that uh, was a competitor to Cisco, so I, I, I spent so, some time in this industry, not hosting, but in uh, you know, uh, other parts of the internet industry. And I wanna say that hosting is clearly the heart and soul of the internet economy. I mean, what would the internet be without the hosting industry? It's where the interesting stuff comes from. You know, anyone can put up a Facebook page or something or do whatever, but where the interesting companies come from? Where does the innovation come from? It comes from almost always being independently hosted when you look over the long history of the internet. Uh, my little website itself, while not particularly impressive to anyone, was written by me uh, in HTML, shitty HTML code, and is on DreamHost somewhere. And I think that is kind of what keeps the internet great and weird, is the presence of independent hosting, independent sites, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, who are out there doing their thing. I just think it's so important and that your industry is uh, so important. And there's, over its history, this is where I'm gonna talk about the past, there's been a few laws or a few norms that have been absolutely critical uh, to the success of your industry. And I'll mention two of them. Um, one is net neutrality. Uh, based, on, uh, based on the following proposition. What makes net neutrality profound, or what makes the internet profound, is that it is in an economy where it doesn't cost that much to get started, and where more often than in other parts of the economy, the best products actually win. Now, not always. <laughs> not always, but it was possible, for example, in 2000, in, in the early 2000s, <coughs> for Google, which was then a startup, to take on a much larger company, Yahoo, and defeat them because they had a better product. No, it was possible for companies uh, like Etsy today to challenge eBay, which is an incumbent, has billions of more money, because they are able to start on the open internet and just reach their customers. And that depends crucially on the concept, which has been basically the, the design principle of the internet since the 70s, that there is not perfect equality, but rough equality. You know, my little website, timwu.org, it's not going to impress uh, anybody, but it loads reasonably fast. It's not 10 times worse than, 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 a, than a big website. And that has been crucial for small businesses to have their chance against large business. And that has been crucial to a turning cycle of creative destruction. When companies get old on the internet, when they start to become uh, obsolete, when they no longer have it, they are challenged and it is harder for them to destroy their challengers 
because the open internet provides a path to reach customers with a better product. And who do those new companies usually rely on? Usually the hosting industry, which is why you are so important to this process. All right. So net neutrality has two, when you boil it down, has two really important principles. It recognizes that everything on the internet only reaches customers when it goes through a carrier, you know, cable or, or, or Verizon, and that typically the last mile is either a monopoly or a duopoly. So the cable industry and the phone industry have long been in the position to decide who wins and who loses on the internet. They could do this very, the, the easiest way they could have done this, had they thought about it, was to simply block stuff. You in this room know how easy it is actually to block sites if, if you need to. So for example, in another version of history without net neutrality, when Skype got started, and it started eating into the margins of the phone companies, why let anyone access that site? There's no, if you're thinking about it in a purely business-driven way, without any norm of net neutrality, without any idea of internet openness, Skype would have been killed immediately. Would have been just been blocked. When you think about Netflix, when it got started, started streaming video to people, started gaming some traction, why on earth should the cable industry, to think to itself, why should we allow this competitor to us survive on our wires? So I'm telling you in a different version of history, Netflix is toast pretty quickly, one of two ways. Either outright blocked, which is something some countries do, or those of you who work overseas. Uh, Skype was blocked for a long time in, in, in Mexico because the, uh, the Mexican telecom company, they didn't like people using Skype to make cheap calls home. Why would they like that? That's just, you know, they make a fortune, billions of dollars on this. The other way, so the most important principle, the axiom of net neutrality, is thou shall not block. If you are a carrier, you have to deliver the internet, just the internet, and nothing but the internet, to put it that way. You can't you know, deliver an internet that's half the sites, the ones who pay you off, or the ones who don't threaten your business model. And that has been crucial. The second and more subtle principle that has become essential to net neutrality over the years, particularly with the birth of video and voice and other applications, is thou shall not have slow lanes. Which is to say thou shall not, which um, has long been a business model the carrier industry wanted, uh, punitively slow down certain traffic, hoping to attract uh, money payment in order to be in the so-called fast lane, uh, which means not being downgraded, as you, as you know. As you, ever, since you're technical people, you, you know that um, uh, a fast lane is merely the absence of a slow lane or absence of prioritization of traffic. So these two principles, I'm suggesting to you, have been absolutely crucial to the success of the internet as a Schumpeterian, by that I mean constantly evolving, constantly innovating, competitive economy that is subject to Darwinian evolution. By that I mean survival of the fittest, not survival of who has the best connections or who is able to pay off Comcast to get their traffic first. And I'll say to you, if we had lived in a different world, I'd said this before, but you know, Yahoo in 2001, even though they had an inferior search engine, um, could have bought off all the service providers and we would still be using Yahoo today. The problem with an absence of net neutrality is that history gets fixed. When someone gets big enough and they have enough money to pay off the carriers to have their product be the product, the internet gets stuck. And we could have faced the possibility of the internet getting stuck in 2002. So that's not, uh, uh, that is why I think net neutrality has been so important, how you've been so important to the, the economy of the internet. Although I will confess the personal matter, about a year ago, maybe 18 months ago, I was uh, personally distraught. I felt that all of our efforts, all of the efforts for people who, who care about a competitive and open internet had been for naught, 
and that the Obama administration had seriously let us down. And I'll tell you why. There were like five different things. Um, uh, net neutrality had been killed in the courts for complicated legal reasons, but basically because of cowardice on the part of, of uh, the federal officials who were supposed to implement it. Number two, we had the NSA revelations, which revealed that much more, and now you probably knew about it, I won't ask you any questions, <laughs> but you probably knew about it, but much more spying was going on than anyone had realized. Third, we had a lot of prosecution of hackers, you know, really harmless hackers like Aaron Schwartz. Uh, that, in his case, leading to a suicide that really went too far in the use of the criminal law. Patent reform, I don't know how you guys feel about patent, but patent reform had stalled and the, the, the efforts they did really were not that meaningful. So you still had patent trolls out there bugging everybody for billions of dollars of n nonsense fees. And I was like, what was the point of the Obama administration? It was even worse than the Bush administration in some ways. Uh, you know, like how did, how did we get so thoroughly defeated in Washington? those of us who care about an open and competitive internet. Um, and it looked like there was no, no, really no, no chance um, for the open internet. And I'll tell you that the prospects looked dim. We were advocating a new net neutrality rule to, to, to a year ago to try and replace the one that was struck down. We had a chairman of the FCC who was a former cable lobbyist. So that's one problem. Um, let me see, it turned out to be a little surprising. Uh, obviously, none of the carriers, that's AT&T, Comcast, Verizon, they were all against strong net neutrality rules. They wanted a fast lane, of course, and they wouldn't mind the ability to block if they could. Actually, I was once having drinks with a, the Verizon, um, one of their chief lobbyists. We're, I don't know if we're quite friends, but we have a relationship. Uh, and when he gets drunk, he says things, so I like to go drinking with him because I, I learn, <laughs> I often learn like really useful things, and this was one of them. He said, you know, we don't want all of Google's money. We don't want all of the money of the internet. We just want a piece of it. <laughs> we just want, we don't think they should be making so much money. You know, and I was like, you guys, it's not your internet. Why, just because you happen to have the position to coerce people to get the money doesn't mean it's gonna be good. And actually my concern, and this will relate to what I talk about later in my talk, is less about you know, Google having to pay some money to Verizon or something, you know, big deal, they can afford it. It is actually that that will entrench Google and make them impossible, impossible to ever dislodge. And I like Google, they're a good company. But one day something better is gonna come along, just the way they came along and were better than, uh, than Yahoo. And the question is, is one company in a position to stop the future? And we need to make sure that that never happens. You know, that we let companies freeze the future. You can see what that happens in other industry. Look at the airline industry, for example. You know, the last big inventions in airplanes, commercial airliners, were in the 60s, sort of like frozen. The telephone industry got frozen for like 50, 40 years where their idea of innovation, you know, they spent like 10 years on call waiting and call forwarding. <laughs> that was the big step forward. And then every, you know, 10 or 20 years, they'd introduce a new telephone, you know, and it would, have a different color, or they got touch tone. Touch tone took like 20 years, de -de -de, you know, that kind of thing. So there are industries that get frozen. And I guess my life's work is to prevent the internet from becoming like the airline industry or like the phone industry, the old phone industry, where it was just sort of frozen. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned, uh, uh, concerned about this kind of trend. We are in this terrible uh, situation. Um, and not only, as I said, did we have the, obviously the carriers were not interested in that neutrality rule. But the big internet companies, Amazon, Facebook, Google, were perfectly happy to sit on their hands. Now one reason is they've become much more over the years conservative, they don't like to get out on a limb. But also they knew, at the, deep in their hearts, that on an uneven internet, an uncompetitive internet, they win. <laughs> you know, they're already there. It's never going to be the internet giants who advocate for policies that make possible their replacement. They might sort of say they believe in them ideologically. A lot of people in Google, you know, engineers, they have good values. But when it comes down to the bottom line, they're like, well, 
this law is going to make it easier for our replacement to show up in one way, one day. You know, it's like Game of Thrones or something. <laughs> one day, <laughs> kill the king. And so they are kind of all not really that interested in things. And that's maybe partially why some of the big internet companies don't like the hosting industry so much, because they know that's where someone's going to show up who might kill the king. You know, making it easier for small companies. They kind of like to do that, but there's some mixed relationship there. So um, everything seemed uh, somewhat doomed because they were sitting on their hands. Uh, but then, luckily, one day a miracle happened. And maybe you can show this video. <laughs> Our top story tonight concerns the internet a.k.a. the Electronic Cat Database. <laughs> but, but first, let's take just a moment together and appreciate how amazing the Internet is. You can use it to file your taxes, apply for jobs. You can go online right now and buy a case of coyote urine. <laughs> Do you know how difficult it used to be to obtain coyote urine? <laughs> you literally had to give a coyote Gatorade and just wait. It was a mess. The system was a mess. But if you've turned on the news lately, you may have heard some worrying references to the Internet changing. The Federal Communications Commission has agreed to move forward on a proposal that could change the way we use the Internet. At risk, the basic principle of net neutrality. Net neutrality. Net neutrality. Yes, net neutrality. The only two words that promise more boredom in the English language are <laughs> featuring Sting. <laughs> and, and hearing... Hearing... Hearing people talk about it is somehow even worse. As anticipated, the notice proposes to ground the net neutrality rules in Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Oh, my God, that is the most boring thing I've ever seen. <laughs> that is even boring by C-SPAN standards. I would rather read a book by Thomas Friedman than sit through that hearing. <laughs> I would rather listen to a pair of dockers tell me about the weird dream it had. <laughs> I'd rather sit down with my niece and watch Caillou, a children's <laughs> show about a bald Canadian child who lives a life devoid of any incident. <laughs> F you, Caillou! <laughs> Grow some hair and leave the house! <laughs> Find out what the world's a boot! Come on! <laughs> but here's the thing. Net neutrality is actually hugely important. Essentially, it means that all data has to be treated equally, no matter who creates it. It's why the internet is a weirdly level playing field. And startups can supplant established brands. That's how Facebook supplanted MySpace, which supplanted Friendster, which supplanted actually having any friends. <laughs> do, do you remember physically having friends? It was awful. You couldn't tap people's faces to make them go away. <laughs> the, the point is, the internet in its current form is not broken. And the FCC is currently taking steps to fix that. <laughs> the FCC is endorsing new rules that could clear the way for a two-tier system. The rules would open the door for the first time for Internet providers like Comcast and Verizon to charge tech companies to send content to consumers more quickly. Netflix, for example, might pay a premium to ensure that its customers can stream movies more reliably at a cost a startup competitor might not be able to afford. No. This cannot happen. How else is my startup streaming video service, Nutflix, going to compete? <laughs> it's going to be America's one stop resource for videos. Uh, I knew you probably want to watch the rest of it, so to me. But <laughs> so that happened. And you know, little things can make a very big difference because that video came out. Next thing that happened is a lot of the startup. Um, economy, particularly New York and some in San Francisco, started getting active, decided they had to do something, and they started coming to Washington. They started meeting with, with people, and they started saying, you know, this isn't going to fly. And something really quite extraordinary happened last year. The, the, the precedent is really Sopa Pippa, which the hosting industry had a lot to do with, um, is that suddenly, you know, it's sort of like, Geeks will stay quiet for a while, but if they get poked too many times, they rise up <laughs> at these moments. And suddenly, hundreds of thousands, millions of people started sending comments to the FCC. In fact, they sent so many comments, so many phone calls, the servers, I guess they don't use good architecture or whatever, because everything collapsed. They couldn't accept any, any emails. 
And they just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. And the chairman of the FCC actually, you know, wants to do the right thing. The problem is his idea of what the right thing was came just from listening to what Verizon Comcast had to say. But when he started seeing thousands, millions, when he started being visited by all these startups, he started thinking differently about this, and he decided he needed to do more. A crucial point in the fight for net neutrality came when the political part of the White House started thinking, this issue actually kind of matters. I mean, there's a general tendency for all tech issues, <laughs> almost all tech issues in Washington, um, nobody thinks they get the average voter excited. And so politicians feel they can do almost anything they want because no one is going to notice. So that really becomes a lobbyist-driven game. You see, you might have the most progressive senator on one issue, but then it'll be like, well, copyright, no one's really paying attention to copyright except for you know, my friends in, in Hollywood, let's say, so I can take completely their stand. You know, it, 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 and, and, there's, and, they, and often they, uh, they, and telecom's even more like that. I mean, you heard what it's like to talk about telecom. It's crazy issues. No one really seems to understand them well. But somehow net neutrality pierced that fog. People in the White House woke up. Uh, the president was fundraising. And he ended up sitting next to, on several occasions, people, uh, I think one was the CEO of Etsy, another the CEO of Tumblr, who were like, you got to do something about net neutrality. And so November came last year. Democrats lost the Congress. President Obama, nothing to lose, gives this big speech and says, we have to have the strongest possible net neutrality rules. Make it so. A complete turnaround. We were dead in the water a year ago. Total turnaround. Within four months, net neutrality rules became the law. And in fact, they are the law right now. So I call that a good news story. It has a lot to do with activation around an issue that really mattered. And I think and I hope that it preserves some of the competitive conditions of the internet that have been so important to its profit, its uh, growth, and its competitiveness. But I want to spend um, a little bit of time talking now. I said that, in some way, is the past. And I want to talk a little bit about the future. I think that um, one of the great threats to your industry and also the future of a competitive uh, internet is the increasing domination of the internet economy by three, four, or five really big firms. It is typical, I wrote a book, The Master Switch, which chronicles the cycle, this repeated cycle in the information industries, where you have a new invention, something like uh, the telephone or, or um, radio. And typically, for the first 15 years or so, it's an open economy, very competitive, thousands, hundreds of companies. And, you, and uh, you know, they're all competing like crazy. Then after 15, maybe 20 years into it, it starts increasingly to become an oligopoly or maybe a monopoly. There was once a time, 100 years ago, where there were thousands of telephone companies. In com thousands, not hundreds, thousands. Uh, ultimately, they all became one giant monopoly, the Bell Company, AT&T, uh, which then lasted as a monopoly for 70 years. Radio in the 1920s was an ultra-competitive industry. Tines, the tiny stations, all kinds of stuff, ultimately basically became three giant networks. Um, the same trends are happening in the internet today very evidently. In the 1990s, I don't know, maybe when some of you got into the industry, um, almost every sector of the internet economy was highly competitive, you know, uh, dispersed, open, relatively easy to get into. More and more parts of it have come under control of about four or five uh, companies. So, and I, you know who they are, Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple's sort of, Apple and iOS in particular, Apple. Um, 
Now, I don't begrudge these companies. These are excellent companies, most of them. I don't like Facebook so much, but they're, they're excellent companies. <laughs> you know, they're, they're good engineers. Their founders had a great vision, and I, and I don't want to begrudge companies for basically being successful. But the question comes for the future of the economy is whether what we are facing is fair competition between the big guys and the little guys or whether it gets unfair. And I want to rewind to the 1990s where you may remember there was a small upstart company named Netscape that had succeeded with this crazy new product called the browser. And they had reached a market position where they had about 90% of the browser market. Microsoft decided it wanted that market. In fact, it decided it wanted to, to control commerce on the internet, uh, the famous 1995 memo. And so they took a number of measures, many of which ended up being illegal, to make sure that Netscape had no chance of winning. They used their power on the Windows platform to push Netscape nearly out of existence. And it worked. Um, Netscape in 96 or so had about 90% market share. By 2001, it was below 10%. And Explorer had reached 80-something percent of the market, the internet, the, the Microsoft version. Now, if Microsoft had a better product, I'm not begrudged that at all. I know, no one, um, but no one ever said Explorer was a better product. <laughs> it wasn't, no, it was never a better product. And I think it's really important to make sure in the next rounds, when you face against, off against Amazon or, or Google or other companies in particular, when we have these battles between uh, the big five and the smaller companies, that the fight is being fought fairly. <laughs> Once again, I think there's nothing wrong taking advantage of scale or brand name or things like better technology. But it's another thing when you do things like use your platform to push off your competitors and destroy them. It's another thing when you sign uh, industry-wide long-term contracts that make it impossible for uh, smaller competitors to get a start. It is. Uh, not fair fighting when you uh, bid up and overpay for contracts just to get them out of the hands of your competitors. These are the kind of things that I think are the challenge for the internet economy of the future. I think it's very important that, um, that people who are in competition with these giants know the tools they have, know the ways to report illegal behavior, and also that we have a federal government that is watching, <laughs> refereeing, like an NFL game or football game, to make sure that the fight is fair and make sure that the big companies, the dominant five, don't make it impossible for the next great company to replace them. Thank you for your role in the internet economy. Thank you for listening to my comments. And I, I think now I'll have a come with Emily. Thank you once again. Thanks, Tim. So that was kind of the opposite of the boring net neutrality speeches that we saw <laughs> in the video. So that was actually, it, I think it is hard to talk about net neutrality in an interesting sure. way, but you did it. So. Well, I watched uh, Oliver, John Oliver, and I was like, boy, my life has been a waste. He, he worked on this for like five minutes and did a better, or maybe one week, and did a better <laughs> job than like 10 years. But you know, whatever. So I'm just going to ask a few questions. Um, and if we have time, we'll, we'll go to the audience. Um, well, I guess the first question is, you talked about this new law. Are you personally satisfied with this law? I mean, how much remains to be done? The new net neutrality law, yes. I think it is, actually, I think it's good. It's, str it's strong, it's clear, it has a strong legal footing. So I actually am uh, happy. There's a few challenges on the horizon. Number one, it's being challenged in the courts. So um, that victory, that court battle has to be won. And then there's also the question of the rest of the world. You know, net neutrality um, has been less respected in other parts of the world. Obviously, a country like China, certain sites are just blocked. You know, a whole bunch of American competitors are just blocked. And to my mind, has, often in China, has less to do, sometimes that has to do with uh, censorship, which obviously I don't think is great. But sometimes it's also just to protect the Chinese competitor. 
And so I think we need to wake up to the fact that violations of net neutrality are not just a matter of free speech and, and innovation, which I care about, but they're also sometimes a matter of trade policy. That is, I think sometimes countries encourage their service providers to help a local company, that, you know, to disfavor foreign countries or block them in order to help out a local company. And I, there's a lot of Chinese companies that have benefited enormously from, from that. So on that note, can you talk a little bit more about what you think is the proper role of the government with respect to yeah. the internet? You know, this is a big question, kind of the problem I, I've struggled with. So I, I, um, I have very conflicted roles about the role of, of, of government on the internet, and I'll, I'll, I'll describe that carefully. Some of the worst disasters in the history of US tele technology policy have been the government trying to plan the future. I mean, we saw last year the government can't even put up a website. Even, I mean, they did, ultimately, they had to like, you know, I, I, I bet people in this audience particularly were, I mean, frustrated by that, being a little bit closer to, to knowing just how hard that wasn't to make, especially with a budget of, what, half a billion dollars to set up a decent website. So that's one problem. And just in general, like, when government plans the future, so this is the part where I sound like a libertarian, when government plans the future, they, they get it wrong a lot. You know, and they also get on these weird obsessions that take a long time. So for example, historically, the government became obsessed in the 60s with UHF TV, and like that was gonna be the future. You know UHF, or, I, this, is, this is ancient history, but like a little bottom dial, and they were like, nah, cable's not gonna be important. Um, I like HDTV, but the government spent billions in getting everyone to HDTV, it was like a process that took forever. So when the government plans the future, it does a terrible job. Uh, and I think there's always, always a danger of over-centralization of planning. You know, that was the problem for the Soviet economy, um, <laughs> to make it uh, short, is when a planned economy is almost always beaten by an unplanned economy. And the reason is, it's a really profound reason which you'll know if you're close to entrepreneurs, is the future is really, really hard to predict. Who would have thought Twitter would be worth a damn, you know? Like, no one would sit around and be like, we need a Twitter <laughs> when they're planning the future. We need to have that. Like, what the hell is that? No one knew that. Most of the things, you know, think about Google in 2000. I was like, search, I, I was in Silicon Valley then. People were like, search is doomed. I mean, there's no money to be made there. It's over. So people... And, and people think all the same. So it's incredibly hard to be right about the future, which is why you need, I think, an open system like the open internet, a Darwinian uh, competition of all against all, let the uh, fittest survive. And that is how the future evolves in its best form. Um, on the other hand, what I do think government's role is, is to m make sure that process I just described happens. Government's better when it is involved in processes. It, in some ways, going back to the Ten Commandments, bans things. Thou shall not block. Thou shall not do this illegal thing. And make it clear what are unfair. I mean, maybe a better analogy is sports. Everyone agrees that actually sports are better with referees, <laughs> right? Um, because let's say hockey, which I grew up with, if you didn't have any rules in hockey, it would just be mixed martial art fighting. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but you know, you would just get the biggest player and crack a, the best player and kill him, or ca crack a stick over his head, that would be how you won, and it would lose uh, the beauty that is its limited combat. I think of the economy as a lot like hockey, is you want it to be rough, you want it to be a real competition, but you don't want people just um, breaking the knees of their competitors. And so government needs to figure out what are the rules that prevent the breaking of the knees. And that is what I think its, its rules are. I think the net neutrality rules, the thou shall not block, thou shall not slow lane, are like don't break people's knees caps. And I think the antitrust laws, when enforced properly, are the same. Here's a couple things. No fixing prices, no um, leveraging your platform to destroy your competitor and so on and so forth, and relatively clear rules, and then let the competition uh, go. That's how I, that's my vision for the internet, and actually all of the economy and the government. 
So that raises interesting questions about who ultimately has the power to affect internet policy, right? So right. take you, for example, you have worked in so many different iterations. You ran for office for lieutenant governor in New York. I'm sure some of you know that. You've worked in government. You've worked in industry. You're an author. You work in, the, in, in uh, uh, universities. So given all those different roles, which what do you think, which of those roles do you think is actually most useful for <laughs> impacting policy, right? Is it as an author? Is it writing an op-ed in the New York Times? Is it working inside government? Is it working from, from industry? I mean, this is a question that I right. grapple with all the time because all question. of those different roles have different benefits. So I'm, I'm curious what you think in, in terms of it. Or is it good to just kind of be in all of them at once? <laughs> <laughs> I think... Um, well, I mean, it, different, obviously different people are suited towards different things. Um, you know, these net neutrality rules uh, could not have gotten where they did without a lot of foot soldiers in Washington. People, very committed people who believe in the ideas. But one thing I think that we have to always, for people who care about internet policy, it is really important to never neglect the importance and the power of good ideas and strong ideas. The people who built the internet originally, you know, way back in the 70s, when they, they came up with some of the basic ideas of TCP, they were solving technical problems, but they were doing them in fairly profound ways, I think, where they were thinking, all right, we want to build you know, the, the, a network that can connect all the networks. How are we going to do this? And, you know, thinking about it from a relatively pure way, that sort of engineering ethos, I think that. Uh, you know, translating the public policy. It's very important to have big ideas that people march behind and not simply have the idea, okay, this is going to make money for my particular industry. Uh, and one reason I think, for example, copyright, now uh, this industry is in the crossroads of the copyright debates, uh, although you are, I was going to say, besides net neutrality, your other most important law I'd say is, is the uh, Safe Harbor and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, Section 512, um, the notice and takedown law. One thing that the copyright people have always, pro-copyright enforcement, they've always had their side, is they like, this is ultimately about authorship. Mm -hmm. We want America to be a place uh, where, protect, where creative people are protected. Now, maybe they take that idea too far sometimes, but no one in this room can say, well, creative people don't matter. We hate them. Um, Right? It's, it's, so I, I think finding, it's really important in these debates, finding the principles and advocating them uh, repeatedly and, uh, and understanding what they are. Because ultimately, in the long run, the, I, maybe I'm sort of romantic, but I think the righteous ideas win. I think that's true, although I'd push back and say it also has to do with the ability to communicate those ideas, right? Which is we saw with this John Oliver video. You know, I mean, the, the, it's something like net neutrality. If it's not communicated properly and if the American people don't understand why it matters, it can remain a very niche insider. Right. Kind so we of need battle. two things big ideas and late night comedy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those are the key. If only you could kind of like channel the late night economy. Yeah. It's, very, it's very challenging to get. Like, you know, there's been like two episodes. Net neutrality is a big issue to some people. There's been like in the mainstream comedy press, like twice. Do we know the backstory about how that got on his radar? Like um, why he did that? Uh, there's conflicting accounts. There's conflicting accounts. So I can't, uh, I, I don't fully know the backstory. Uh, uh, there's conflicting accounts as to what got President Obama. President Obama was a net neutrality advocate when he was on the campaign trail in 2007. Um, I uh, toot my own horn, but I wrote part of the speech where he announced his net neutrality policy. I was excited, fired up. And then, you know, nothing happened for seven years. <laughs> we had to go through this desert period. And then he came back. You know, then he got uh, fired up again. And I, I think it did have a lot to do with running into people. It's about the power of ideas again. You know, he'd run into people at these tech fundraisers, and they're like, you've got to do something about net neutrality. The president would be like, what, what can you tell me? And it's like, you've got to do something about net neutrality. And he's like, after a while, I said, you know, this is serious. Slightly more cynically, I think they also saw fundraising in the long term. They're like, oh, this matters to people. And the way the American politics works these days is, well, people matter too, but so do donations. And they mm -hmm. were thinking, well, there's at least a constituency here that cares about this stuff. Yeah. 
And so I guess a question that's relevant to the people in this room is what can the hosting industry do to weigh in on this debate or to make their voices heard in this yeah, debate? Yeah, it's, it's a great uh, question. Um, I think that the hosting industry, I, I see the hosting industry as part of the kind of, you know, it's changed a lot and has evolved and consolidated. And, but, you know, it's part of the original OGs of the internet economy, you know, along with the old school ISPs and the startups and, you know, the, the people who went to the internet because there was something exciting there and they wanted to start a business and figure out how to make some money and do something cool. You know that motivation? Which is different than the, oh, we're already running a cable channel, but maybe we should have an internet service. You know, that's a very different thing than going like, all right, I'm going to go and I'm going to try and make it here. There's some exciting opportunity. You know, that, that I, I, and I think of the hosting industry as one of those groups. Those groups are like three or four or five, you know, they, first of all, should know each other. And uh, I, they do, I think the lobbyists know each other. But second of all, when the time comes, and I think you've proven this already, when the time comes, when uh, an issue really matters, uh, rising up, putting in the extra effort, whether it's SOPA, PIPA, net neutrality, you know, not all the time, but when every few years when something really comes up, making the voice heard. And how do you do that? Well, I think you actually have your own lobbyists. I can't remember your coalition, but making sure those guys are good. <laughs> but then also, you know, getting a group of the really the, uh, you guys are friends, you come here, you have your drinks. You know, if something really matters, uh, and it's, I don't know, the year 2018 or something, you say, you know, we should take a visit to Washington and go meet everybody, you know, all the CEOs of the important, and say, here's what our concerns are. Because that's what everyone, all the other industries are doing. And maybe you're already doing it, so I don't want to insult you. But you know, when you're getting around, say, you know, we need to really, because CEOs and ultimately, the government does want to help people. It's just they're always hearing from the people who are there all the time. So they're always hearing from Verizon. They're always hearing from Comcast. And since they hear from all the time, they're like, well, maybe we should help those guys out. <laughs> but when they start hearing from other people, they want to help other people too. So whatever it takes to make sure you get heard, which really means going to meet people, is, I think, the way to get heard. Great. And so um, I don't think that's right. The change somehow. Yeah. I, I think we only have like two more minutes. Um, so and I don't think I'll open it up to questions, because Tim is going to be doing a Q&A lunch at, at 1.30. So that'll probably be a better opportunity to ask questions. Well, does so, anyone have a burning question? Let's see. Yeah, a burning question we can take. OK, you'll, you'll. Oh, he has yeah. one. Wait, are you allowed to ask questions? Aren't you the organizer? <laughs> <laughs> um, when we prepared the session in New York a couple of weeks ago, oh, yeah. you were that talking. Was fun. You, yeah, it was fun, actually. We <laughs> went to the beer garden to prepare. <laughs> um, you talked about um, the opinions of the upcoming uh, presidential candidates on net neutrality. Maybe right. you can give us a short idea of what the take is. Oh, that's an interesting thing. So. Um, there have been, um, I think the Democratic Party, I think Hillary Clinton has changed. Uh, on, in 2007, she was on the wrong side of a lot of issues. I think she just thought it was easier to listen to what the cable industry had to say and basically adopt their positions wholesale. And her advisors in that area were all telecom cable people. So. She got kind of blindsided by Obama, who had the internet voters on her side, had way better websites, all this stuff. So this time, she's determined not to make that mistake and has hired all kinds of net neutrality friendly people. So she, you know, what she personally thinks, nobody knows, and maybe no one will ever know. But she, her, her definitely her policy team is very uh, strong pro open internet group. Some of the Republican Party has staked their positions on very anti net neutrality. Uh, Karn, uh, Kla How do you say her name? The HP. Carly, I can never say her name. Karina, uh, uh, the, form, who, the woman who basically ran HP into the ground, um, <laughs> has decided to run the internet in the ground too, and has started giving speeches about how you know, net neutrality is a disaster for the American economy and will ruin, uh, 
I don't know the lives of whom, I guess, uh, so forth. So there's a little bit, I think the mainstream Republicans are a little bit afraid of the issue because it's not really that popular with the po American public. Yes, we want to give companies the right to block websites. It's also not very popular with bloggers, even Republican bloggers, right-wing bloggers. They're like, what? We're going to be paying Comcast to reach our people? That sucks. And so the Republican Party, I think, is afraid of the issue. Democrat Party is a favorite, but there's certain parts the Republican Party are against it. So that's how it's uh, shaping up. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tim. Sure. That was fantastic. Thanks.